Morning, everyone. It's 11, so we'll get rolling. Um, welcome to today's installment of the Royal T Tyrrell Museum Speaker Series. This week, the Museum and its Cooperating Society are happy to present Dr. Andrew Heckert. Andrew grew up in Ohio, where he obtained his undergrad degree from Denison University in Granville. In 1993, he moved to New Mexico, where he completed both his master's and his PhDs at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque. Since, 19, or since 2005, sorry, Andrew's been based at Appalachian State University in Boone, North Carolina, where he's an associate professor in the Department of Geology and the director of the McKinney Geology Teaching Museum. Dr. Heckard's research program focuses on the vertebrate paleontology and stratigraphy of the American Southwest. He's collected fossils ranging in age from the Devonian to Pleistocene, focuses primarily on Triassic strata of Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. And today, Andrew's going to talk about one of the most iconic of Triassic vertebrates, Aetosaurus, which is also a really fun name to say. And uh, so, Andrew, you want to enlighten us on these critters? Thank you very much. Hi there. Uh, everybody hear me okay? So, excellent. Thank you very much for having me here. And yeah, I know I uh, talk a little about Aetosaurs and where you guys are, of course, you're very familiar with Ankylosaurs. And, but before there were Ankylosaurs, there were Aetosaurs, or as those of us in the Triassic like to think of it, is there were Aetosaurs before there were Ankylosaurs. Um, so, uh, before I really get rolling, of course, I mean, what I'm going to talk to you guys about is an array of things, topics that I've collaborated with a number of people on over the years. Um, Aetosars honestly started for me as a bit of a hobby project while I was doing a master's on microvertebrates. Um, my advisor, Spencer Lucas, had some fossils. He's like, oh, you should describe these or whatever. So they began as something that I was doing while trying to accumulate some microvertebrate assemblages. And so I've worked with a wide range of people, some people also in North Carolina. I was uh, happy to move to a state that also had Triassic deposits. Argentine colleagues, German colleagues. Um, my students have, been, uh, have helped me collect Aetosars in, um, from the American West for the last 10, 12 years. And Devin Hoffman, who's now at Virginia Tech, has been extremely influential. We'll show some of the work I've done with him before my programs have always been very well supported by volunteers and the Mexico Museum in particular um, basically we were understaffed and so everything the collection the preparation the collections everything was very much a volunteer powered endeavor and of course I've had um, the fortune to have some funding from a variety of sources and thank you guys very much for uh, bringing me up here um, so what is an Aetosaur? I, I hope throughout this talk to try and answer all the journalistic questions if you are. Well, what is, what is the thing? Who studies it? When did they live? Where did they live? What do we know about them? And because um, not infrequently when I've had an article come out on Aetosaurs, I've had people, oh, are those related to Ankylosaurs? Are those, you know, well, and, yeah, well, they are related to Ankylosaurs, but so are crocodiles, um, or, you know, so are we, for that matter, right? I mean, we're all related, but they're not closely related. But they are these, um, he you know, heavily armored animals with a carapace, if you will, made of a variety of osteoderms. This is me in Argentina with a, a very, uh, not relatively correct, this is a 1960s vintage reconstruction. But I like it because, I mean, aside from being sort of reminiscent of the Crystal Palace, it also, um, it gives you some indication of the size of these animals. They're not particularly large animals. There were some much larger ones. And there was a big set of Triassic Arcosar reviews published in 2013 that I was happy to be a part of the Aetosar one. And so here's a, a list of authors, and most of us have been on um, most of the literature on Aetosaurs that's been published in the last couple decades, one or the other of these authors. Uh, okay, so the Triassic, um, more and more as we, as we find more and more Triassic animals around the world, we find out that almost all the cool things that crocodilians and or dinosaurs have done, some Triassic animal did something sort of broadly similar to that before. Um, from things that have been known for almost two centuries now, like phytosaurs, which um, you know, Gavial uh, sort of 
resemble these other crocodilians. And of course, Temnospondyl amphibians had had these kind of long snouted things long before. Aetostars have actually been known, I'll show you, for about a century and a half now, a little more. And then lots of other things that, that um, we think of as sort of classically dinosaurian or um, things like you know, losing all the teeth in your snout, putting a big sail on your back. There was just a recent paper published about how this Rallisuchian called Smock may have um, engaged in Tyrannosaurid like osteophagy. Um, there's this very weird animal called Trioptichus that sort of looks like its skull was reminiscent of a Pachycephalosaur. We've even got horned animals now in the Triassic. So there's all kinds of things happening in the Triassic, I, albeit at much smaller body size and usually in a different non dinosaurian lineage but that are still reminiscent of things that we see later on in the, in the Mesozoic. Um, but Aetosaurs in particular are, you know, have been long known, and they do superficially resemble Ankylosaurs, or Ankylosaurs superficially resemble them, um, but, right, both heavily armored animals, um, oftentimes with lots of spines laterally. Um, I will show you some illustrations of how Aetosaurs may have had somewhat weaponized tails or at least invested heavily in protecting their tails um, and so on. So just, you know, you can read all these highlights. They're, the armors are, are distinct. On the other hand, when um, Zeapelta, this is a, the Ankylosaur Zeapelta, when this was published, I was just fascinated with that because I was like, I think I published a very, very similar figure just a year or two ago. Now, the scale is entirely different. Um, Legos are, are wonderful metric tools here, so that's a five centimeter scale there. Um, so that, that specimen is only a few inches across, whereas a, you know, this is almost a foot, you know, 30 centimeters just in this vacant space here. But these are both neck rings, cervical rings of these two not at all closely related animals. They're very, um, very convergent here. And um, there's actually a fairly good diversity of Aetosars. They, they come in a variety of body forms. They're all quadrupedal. Um, they've been found at varying sizes. These are almost surely juveniles, but there's still some specimens that we think are barely over a meter long total body length. Um, whereas there's a giant individual of this animal that was pretty surely six meters or more long. So um, very large um, by the standards of the Triassic anyway, animals. And a fair diversity of, um, of body forms. About 25 or so genera that we all agree on, um, give or take 30 or so named species. Uh, when skulls are very uncommon of Aetosaurs, they've not been found often, and when they have been found, they're often not well preserved. But when you see them, there, you're, there's clearly there's some diversity here too that we need to explore better, and some of my colleagues are, are working on this. They're not all doing exactly the same thing. Uh, incidentally, the name Aetosaurus comes from uh, the, the Germans who named it. It was, named, it was meaning eagle lizard, and that was named for Aetosaurus here, which had a really um, narrow pointed snout, which is actually pretty unusual. Most other Aetosaurs have this slightly expanded snout here. They may or may not have uh, teeth at the very tip of the snout. You, some of them have essentially lost all their premaxillary teeth. Others have a, a more complete dentition. So you know, they're doing a variety of things. Whatever they're doing, it's not just one niche that they have occupied uh, through geologic time. So fundamentally to understand an Aetosaur, and the way I, I got into them is that they are heavily armored animals. And effectively, what you have is you have columns of armor. Um, and I, I was just talking with Caleb here earlier. We both kind of stumbled upon the same idea, right? You have this grid, and you have to come up with some way to describe it. And we both decided independently for him for notisards, myself here for Aetosaurs, that you wanted to have the things that parallel the vertebral column. Let's call that a column. And then we have transverse rows. And with Aetosaurs, they are very definitely associated with the vertebral column. So that essentially every row of osteoderms is matched up with the vertebra. There's some funny things that happen later on in their evolution up in the neck, but that basically 
you have a paramedian osteoderm, a left and a right, and then a lateral osteoderm, a left and a right, that extend from the skull all the way to the tip of the tail. Some aetosaurs then also have a ventral carapace, which actually can have quite a few rows of more square osteoderms. And then many, but perhaps not all, had um, an imbricated set of armor or a chagrin of armor uh, covering the limbs. Um, all of this means that um, there's a lot of possible fossils to recover. These are fairly durable, and so, and you, I'll hope to show you that they have a lot of distinctive features that have allowed us to, in many cases, identify aetosaurs from relatively um, sparse remains. In fact, there are many taxa where all we have is their armor, and that, but we've still successfully demonstrated that it's a different taxon than any previous one, so they are known solely from their armor. Okay, so again, a variety of, of body plans. Some of these guys are very wide-bodied. Some of them are very spinose. Desmatosuchus is probably the most famous aetosaur. It was, had a role in Walking with Dinosaurs and some other shows. And with its great big shoulder spines is, is very distinctive. It's been known for some time. Um, this is, to date, about the only northern hemisphere reconstruction of an aetosaur that's really on display. Um, this is in Stuttgart. And this is sort of the plesiomorphic or the basal aetosaur pattern, which was a lot of armor that was not particularly spinos, um, but just a series of imbricated plates. And the diversity of aetosaurs is sort of mixed between all of those different body forms. There's no real distinct trend in their evolution. So where do they fit in the, in the general family tree of um, archosaurs? They are on the crocodilian line here. So, um, so again, not at all closely related to ankylosaurs by any stretch. And phytosaurs, those superficially crocodilian um, Triassic reptiles, um, have been various. Recently, some people have found them outside of um, this line that's now called Pseudosuchia. Um, Others, you know, traditionally they were usually recovered as just inside there. So depending on where phytosaurs are, the aetosaurs are one of the earliest branching, one of the more basal forms of the crocodile line archosaurs. Okay, so I actually kind of prefer, I, I found this chart in somebody's progress report for a European project, but I actually have kind of partial to this diagram because it gives you a little bit more indication of, especially in the Triassic, this variety of different things that are happening in different of these lineages doing things that were eventually mimicked by dinosaurs. But again, you see that the aetosaurs are down here very near the base of the, the crocodile line split um, and therefore not particularly closely related to dinosaurs. Um, like anything, we could, we've done uh, many phylogenies of these things. We, you know, since, ever since computer-assisted phylogeny, reconstruction has been a a thing, we have been trying to do this. There are some real challenges here, not the least of which is while there's a lot of information in the armor and there are actually many characters scored for the armor because there are some taxa such as Echinosuchus here, Gorgetosuchus, that are really known only from armor. Unfortunately, there are other taxa such as Etobarbacanoides and to a lesser extent Pulsinosuchus, which have essentially no armor preserved with them. Most of the skeleton is other parts. And so, by definition, those are always going to be ambiguously related as to each other. Um, but so, we're still in a state of flux. If you've watched Aetosar trees develop over the course of the last couple of decades, they've, um, taxa have migrated around quite a bit within the trees. And also, you'll see that, um, for those of you who deal with these kind of things, there's nothing really strongly supported. There's relatively few things other than all of these are wide-bodied animals. These are the very spinose animals. They are probably pretty closely related. Um, but we just do not have a great handle. We need more and better fossils of these things. Um, so again, you know, there seems to be a clade that's mostly wide-bodied animals, some a clade that's a lot of fairly spinose animals, but that there are plesiomorphic animals also spread throughout the tree. When did they live? Uh, they're Triassic animals. They're actually exclusively late Triassic animals. 
Um, and if I can give a little plug for the Triassic here, if you've not been watching the Triassic time scale for the last couple of decades, one of the things that has become eminently clear is that, of course, it was originally subdivided based on fossil occurrences, and it's effectively ammonite evolution. And it was divided into a series of zones based on, the, uh, on various Triassic ammonites. And then now that we've finally been able to find and, and refine these, the, these correlations and find beds that are datable within there, one of the things we found is that while the, our knowledge of the Triassic is it's been about 50 million years long throughout the entirety of my professional career. But one of the things that's become increasingly apparent is that the late Triassic is actually the majority of Triassic time. And that immediately after the Permo-Triassic extinction event, these evolutionary rates must have been quite high. And so the early Triassic and the middle Triassic actually occupy a relatively small amount of Triassic time. There are Aetostars known from the Carnian. There's not anything that's clearly a middle Triassic Aetostar ancestor. Um, but they probably, they should be, extend back further into the record. But as, effectively, Aetostars live during this last 30-some million years of the Triassic. So they had a respectable career. They, um, they lived um, for a good 30 million years. The oldest ones are known from South America. There are very young ones known from North America. Um, and then if we look, there's, I, the phylogeny, like I say, is in such a state of flux, I felt no sen there was no sense in making it really time calibrated because I feel like the branches are, are going to move around. But what you will see there across the top is that I just put a bunch of N's and C's and a couple R's, which is, is the taxon Norian, is it Carnian, or is it Rishan? And the take home I want you to get from that is that there must have been a, quite a bit, I mean, some of these fairly derived taxa are actually very early appearing. So whatever happened in the Carnian, or presumably before this, there was a, a fairly explosive or rapid radiation, a fairly extensive diversity. And then some of these taxa are actually, you know, these fairly plesiomorphic ones, still show up. Some of the very last Aetosars are still um, you know, scattered across the tree. So they appear, they were fairly diverse at their first stratigraphic appearance, and they remain fairly diverse across the entirety of their 30 million year career. There are no Jurassic Aetosars. There's not even any candidates for Jurassic Aetosars. The, the latest Triassic record of terrestrial tetrapods is not as good, I think, as some other people would like you to think it is. They definitely go extinct very late in the Triassic. Um, to the extent that that um, extinction is catastrophic across all tetrapod clades, I have um, some misgivings of, because there are clearly there are far fewer Rishan Aetosars than there are Norian, although again, the Norian is hugely long, and there, a lot of these taxa turn over, so um, they're not all there for the extent of the Norian. But in any case, you know, rapid diversification, and they stay relatively diverse throughout their geologic history. Um, of course, the Triassic is the time of Pangaea, and Ron Blakey is well known for making these beautiful images of what you know, hypothesized uh, configurations of Pangaea. So here is, here's North America um, for scale. And Aetosaurs are known from across a great deal of Pangaea. Um, so if we look at it in a sort of a more you know, academic fashion, Right, there's, this is from our review in 2013, and you see that there are Aetosars scattered across Pangaea. Um, a few telling things, it's, um, there are none from Thailand, and there's rocks of the appropriate age, but the record there is not fantastic. Curiously, there are no Aetosars, there are no Phytosars either, from South Africa, and we have upper Triassic rocks in South Africa, and so you would surely think that with Aetosars in Argentina and Brazil, that South Africa would also be a possible place. So there's some kind of curious thing. I don't know why we do not have Aetosars from South Africa. Um, 
knowing where I am, I thought I did ch I checked with Hans Seuss on, on Sunday, because I had, and I had forgotten that they had published this paper. So um, this is the Canadian record of Aetisars at time present. Um, there are a few oscillated osteoderms from the Triassic deposits around the Bay of Fundy in Nova Scotia. So unfortunately, there's, very, there's essentially no Canadian record of Aetisars. On the other hand, the next person who finds a decent Aetisar in Nova Scotia will have the best Canadian Aetisar fossil because this is, that's literally it. Um, so, but I mean, and you do have Triassic, I'm not sure how much of it's Upper Triassic, Marine Triassic in British Columbia. And so you can always hold out hope that you'll have a, a, a Borea Pelta-like occurrence of some Aetisar drifting out into that sea sometime. Um, unfortunately, these osteoderms are not very distinctive at all. There's a paramedian eventral. Um, there's really not much that we can say about those a, a osteoderms. Um, one fun thing about studying Aetisars is that a variety of very famous paleontologists have at least touched on them. The original one, Stagonolepis, was found or described by Louis Agassiz. Um, he was under the impression that it was from the old red sandstone, and so he thought that whatever this was was one of those Devonian fish. So it got the name Stagonolepis robertsoni. Um, we now know that is, of course, not Devonian. And in fact, this other fairly famous gentleman, a guy named Huxley, you know, corrected Agassiz in 1859 and 1870. Um, and showed that those are actually from the new red sandstone Triassic deposits in Scotland. Um, the U.S. bone wars of Cope and Marsh, um, Aetisars did not escape from that. Cope actually had the more um, useful contributions, I guess I would say. He, you know, he's na he named a couple of taxa, both of which are valid at some level still today. Um, he found and named typothorax specimens, and he also named something that includes uh, what we now know as Desmatosuchus. Um, Marsh described some fossils from Eastern North America, um, and because these German individuals, the Frosses, um, had described Aetisaurus by then, he did coin the name Aetisauria. Um, the Frost specimens are, um, include some spectacular specimens. This is, in many ways, one of the most impressive Aetisar fossils you can stumble across. This is a lithograph, um, and then this is a reconstruction of the block, and the astute of you have already seen my, my Lego scale bar here, so this is just two inches across here. Um, so there's 20-some individuals on that block. It's a stunning specimen. Unfortunately, having been discovered in the 19th century and prepared in the 19th century, it was prepared without benefit of magnification, really. They did not use microscopes when they preserved it, and so it's not once you get closer to it, it, it doesn't always get to look that much better. Still, it's a fascinating, very interesting thing. I was fortunate enough to study it again last year um, here in Stuttgart. And I mean, obviously, we are in a world-class museum here, They're right where we're standing, right? You guys have amazing collections and amazing exhibits. Um, but I do have a soft spot in my heart for when the Germans decide to collect something they really go all out. So this is one side of their oversized collection here. This is a cell phone panorama, obviously. So here's my dual desk for the week in that Aetisar block. And the thing I have in red, way back there at the end, you know, that's a megalodon. That's a giant shark, you know, clear down there. I mean, this enormous hall. These are basically, these are all the ichthyosaurs. Uh, but they had stumbled across some Aetisars, and they're happy to let you work on them. Other famous early 20th century paleontologist, Frederick von Huna, very famous uh, for working on dinosaurs and other archosaurs. Um, he worked some on Aetisars, principally the German and American ones. So here's an image of him. This is not an Aetisar, it's a mammal-like reptile. A fellow named Erman Cowles Case was very influential, collected a lot of Aetisars in Texas, um, and collected the more iconic specimens of Desmatosuchus. Um, but they were always sort of an incidental, you know, each of these fell, you know, you know, a paper a decade here or there on Aetisars, not well, um, well understood. Joseph Gregory was um, famous at Yale and Berkeley. And this fellow, Alec Walker, is, was hugely influential. He did a dissertation on those old red Aetisars and, so, and really well illustrated monograph that came of it. And so much of the kind of, you know, he sort of 
set the standard for what everybody thought of as Aedes are sort of the first modern reconstructions, things that look like this. So you see that, I mean, that looks pretty similar to all the uh, reconstructions I've been showing you. So um, he was known for just a handful of, of monographs as really his contributions. So the really important thing in the terms of the art of ADISAR studies is this paper in 1985, where a couple of researchers associated with the University of California, Berkeley, um, published about the ADISAR osteoderms from Petrified Forest National Park, which is entirely Triassic rocks um, and has several superposed assemblages. And if you're into paleontology at this time, right, and we're just starting to get the capability of doing phylogenies by coding characters with zeros or ones, a table like this, and you're like, oh, that could be turned into a bunch of zeros and ones, and we might be able to just from osteoderms be able to say something about the relationships of these animals. And of course, it's also the advent, you know, this is when we're moving from typewriters to word processing, and the, sp the pace of scientific discovery and description can really pick up. So if you look at today, okay, here's a relatively recent phylogeny. And the starred specimens, the yellow stars, are all things that were known in 1985 and had a name in 1985. The orange stars are things where the specimen has, was known or had been described or somebody might have been kind of playing with it but had not actually been named. And then all the other specimens have been named since then. Um, and in, in part, like I said, some of them just because the armor is relatively distinct uh, between several different taxa. So we've had an explosion in the last 20 years, 30 years really, the last 30 years of you know, going from maybe a, a dozen or so named genera to you know, better part of 30 actually, not all of which are, are good enough to include in an analysis like this. But fundamentally this explosion ties directly back to this realization that the osteoderms are, are quite distinct if you're willing to, to do some um, detailed nitty gritty work with them. Um, so my training is principally geological. I, I'm really a, a geologist at heart. My degrees come from geology departments, essentially. Um, but of course, the, the paleobiology of an animal is a fascinating thing. And I, you know, so I, I like to kind of play with it and try and figure out as much as we can. So I'm going to try and show you here in the next little bit just some of the things that we're thinking about Aetisars right now and what, what we understand of them. So things about how they may have moved, their trace fossil record, their diet, how they grew, uh, maybe even a little about metabolism here. So here's a much, this is a much more recent sculpture from in Argentina at their Talampaja Park. And that, that's an animal called Neoetosauroides. Okay. Um, articulated Aetosaur fossils remain very rare, um, frustratingly so. But when we do find them, I mean, even here, there's barely enough to get digit counts off of each finger. But fundamentally, they do, if you, if you do what we call the Cinderella method of does the, does the foot match the footprint kind of question, um, particularly nice specimens like this one that was found by a, a volunteer, Scott Sucker, who works with me in New Mexico. Um, the beautiful thing about this is even though it's articulated, the feet were found sort of flip-flopped. So you can see one in Palmer view, the underside, and you can see the other one in the dorsal view so that you get a, a decent look at each one. Um, I mentioned um, for Darren actually here, there's uh, one of them, the one metatarsal is a couple centimeters shorter than the other. I think it was compressed and fractured or something. Um, so, but I mean, you know, articulated skeletons are great to work with, although they can also be challenging, but at least we got good feet out of this. Um, so we can make a fairly convincing case, I think. This is a piece of artwork by Matt Selesky, um, and of all the things of his that I managed to put a tagline on, I failed to put it on this one. Um, but trying to show what we know of that specimen and the footprints it would make. There's a Triassic tract called Brachychirotherium. It is widespread throughout um, Pangean deposits, and it seems to match very well with Aetisars. They are not exclusively to Aetisars, but, um, but it certainly matches very well with Aetisar footprints. This very small four-foot impression, a, a much larger PES impression, 
and it seems to match well with our reconstructions of that animal. Um, also, fairly upright animal, especially um, here in the hind limbs. The hind limbs, I think, have to be very much pillars beneath the body. The forelimbs, probably more sprawling, but still able to kind of swing around and leave these small impressions just outside of the, the back limbs. Uh, so we have some thought that they, you know, these have adaptations that suggest that maybe they, were, they could dig, that, that you know, they have basic limb proportions. This is a recent article on a Polish Aetisar. Here is another specimen from New Mexico, a relatively complete skeleton, although this one lacks much of the forelimb. But fundamentally, the limb proportions are similar to that seen in modern animals that do, that do a fair amount of digging. There's some thought that maybe that expanded tip of the snout also helped it do a little bit of digging. Um, they're, they're fairly stocky animals as it was, so the robust muscle attachments, you could argue, are maybe just because you're carrying all this armor around. But there's also the proportions are similar to what we see in a variety of digging animals today. So there's some thought that whatever they were doing, they may well have been adapted for digging. They don't have, like if you would consider 10 or 12 adaptations of classical of diggers, they don't have nearly all of those, but they have six or seven or so. Um, again, like I say, the skulls, fairly diverse. They are on the crocodile line. You see that the teeth tend to be pointed at the very least. Um, and various people have over the years hypothesized all manner of um, dietary niches for them. This is a wonderful German specimen of an animal called, of an Aetisar called Paratypothorax. And you see that the teeth don't really look like a plant-eating animal. Um, but they don't really you know, look super predatory either. And certainly, this is, a very, this is not an animal that's chasing down much of anything. So what exactly are they eating is, remains um, up in the air. And certainly, there are different taxa must have been doing different things. I have colleagues who have argued that some taxa have greater bite force, that others have um, a little bit more, uh, seem to have more of a bite, higher bite speed at the expense of bite force. And so there's some thought that maybe these things were rooting around and eating insects or other things in, in tree trunks and rotten vegetation and so on. Uh, it's just, it is very enigmatic because that sure doesn't look like a great dentition for eating plants, but the body doesn't look like it should be a carnivore, a predator of any sort. Um, so whatever they're doing, it's an unusual niche. And on many of these Triassic deposits, they're the only reptile that even looks remotely herbivorous. So it's always been sort of assumed that if you have any sort of food web at all, that these are the herbivores in that food web. Um, but there, it really honestly remains somewhat enigmatic. Um, I've had the fortune to travel to Argentina, work with some Argentine colleagues. And this is a specimen that will illustrate some of the joys and frustrations of working with an Aetisar. They are extensively heavily armored. Um, so that's cool. It protected a great deal of the specimen. On the other hand, finding the bones is a challenge. The, um, they're almost completely covered by the osteoderms in some places. And so this is really just sort of the back end of one Aetisar. But it has some important paleobiological implications, I think. So here's sort of a draft of what, we, what we're thinking about it. Oddly enough, um, I mean, I don't know how much you can do with it, but you can actually find, Walker had found the cloacal vent in, a, um, in Stagonolepis. We can see it here in this specimen of possibly an animal called Aetosauroides. It's a, it's a fairly broad opening, actually, within the Aetisar. And so, of all things, I am the world's expert on Aetisar cloacal vents because we had also found this in Typothorax in an animal called Cohomosuchus. The one in Typothorax is actually quite fun because if you notice, there's a bunch of spikes around these osteoderms. And these osteoderms had been found loose previously and thought, were, thought to be part of the side armor. And when I found them on this one specimen, I, said, I knew, it was like, oh, we have this other specimen. Please, please, please don't have the spikes 
around the cloacal vent because it's going to be really exciting if we've got some sort of sexual dimorphism here based on the spikes. But sadly, the other specimen has the spikes too. So I don't know what that says about type of thorax. Um, but they had a fairly spiked cloacal vent. Some other things that are kind of cool about some of these specimens is here's this Argentine specimen again. And this is the ventral armor. And you can see two nice columns. And then starting here, they actually are fused together. Um, and many of these osteoderms, usually on the dorsal series, it's a little easier to tell, they have what is called the center of ossification now. And that does seem to be what it is. It's where the, um, where the bone first starts to um, ossify. And so these are sort of co-ossified and fused together. And so then if you section these, your best chance of getting an archive of the, of the animal's growth is to go right through that center of ossification or, or very close to it. And you'll actually get these, these lines of arrested growth, the, essentially the tree rings analogy, if you will, of how the animal grew. And also it shows that on, you know, vent or caudally on this animal, it actually, these osteoderms co-fuse together. Now, one thing that has changed over the course of my career is when I started, we were very, you know, very enthused about being able to tell Aetisar osteoderms apart by characteristics of their ornamentation and other features. And now when you, like many things in science, when you really dive down into it, start getting into the nitty gritty details, you start to find things that make you less certain of what you thought you knew. Um, so these are all examples of the lateral side of these paramedian osteoderms. This is some work I did with Huli de Soho and her student, um, Jeremias Taborda. And he did a wonderful job of pointing out, we had always described this animal's osteoderms as having a fairly radial pattern. And yet there were clearly differences between this radial pattern and this radial pattern. And he eventually called this anastomosing after the pattern of the, um, the ridges between the pits and grooves. And Sure enough, if your osteoderm is relatively narrow, it's anastomosing. And if it's much wider, proportionately, it's much more radial and stretched out and elongate. And I'm quite certain this has got a lot to do with the growth pattern of the animal itself. Um, and there's a variety of histologists who have worked on crocodilians who are kind of showing broadly similar things. So, whoops, how did I do? Um, so here on the medial side, much more anastomosing. This more rapidly growing lateral side, much more radial. And I think that has some implications for how much we really can do with some of the ornamentation. So briefly, a couple of the things that I've done more recently. I was fortunate to move to a state that had Aetisar fossils. Um, this one we named Gorgetosuchus shortly before Zia Pelta, the name comes from the medieval knight's collar, the gorget. Here's our cervical ring, if you will. There's um, some properly attributed Matt Seleski art. Um, and so this is an example of a specimen where that was what it looked like when I got to Raleigh. And I had seen some very spiky armor of type of thorax. And I was like, oh, you guys have a tail of an Aetisar. And then as they continued to prepare it out, we realized, oh, no, that's a neck. And even though we only have the armor, that armor is distinct for any other specimen. So we were able to name that animal a few years ago. Um, there's our, our neck ring collar. So even though all we had was really about 20 or so osteoderms, um, there's various features of it that are distinct that from both um, Longosuchus and Leucosuchus here as a couple of contemporaneous animals. Um, Another specimen that we had, and here's where um, I was able to name this thing, but then my student Devin Hoffman did a, his senior thesis doing some other things with it. This is a relatively small specimen, um, only, uh, I don't know, these scale bars are probably five centimeters long. Um, a little roadkill specimen, we call them, a smashed skull, smashed armor. Here's the ventral side. And again, the huge challenge with these things is that you have a whole lot of armor covering the body. So we, get, we did get it CAT scanned. We had relatively limited ex, um, success with the CT scanning. But we were able to find, Devin was able to segment out and find a few more elements that we knew were there. Unfortunately, these Triassic rocks in North Carolina, they've been buried quite deeply. They're not technically metamorphosed, but they're getting close. And so the density differences between the armor on the top, the armor on the bottom, the bones inside, and the matrix are made this project 
very challenging. But one of the things we were also able to do is um, section some of these bones and uh, get an archive of the lags here. So these are the lines of arrested growth in some of the osteoderms or here in a radius. Um, and generally speaking, we, we were far from the first people to look at Aetosaurs and, and document lags and so on. But generally speaking, one big difference between them and the Ankylosaurs is they're slow growing. They are, for the most part, not fast growing animals. Uh, two meter long Aetosaur, there are two meter long, roughly, individuals that have 20 some lags in them. So they were over 20 years old because these are the, essentially the lines that form every time growth um, truncates during a, a slow season, a, a winter or dry season. Um, yet we were able to show that this one Aetosaur, Coahomasuchus, appears to be growing relatively rapidly. Okay, so these specimens are all roughly equivalent in size. This one actually has the widest osteoderms, yet only has one or two legs, whereas this one has five or so, so it was clearly at least six years old, and this one was perhaps 10 years old. And um, so there seems to be some diversity in their growth pattern. I feel like this is fairly, um, we've demonstrated this fairly conclusively. And um, interestingly, now Colomasuchus, one of the things that makes it distinct is that the patterning on the armor is extraordinarily faint. So you, you basically cannot see it in this picture, but it's these very, very faint grooves and ridges right along here. Well, this is also the most rapidly growing of the specimens. So it, to me, it's not actually terribly surprising that it emulates this very radiate pattern, but it's actually growing perhaps so rapidly that it's just simply not depositing the thicker ridges on the, on the bone. So I have another colleague who sought me out who's actually very interested in their metabolism. And reconstructing metabolism is, of course, very challenging especially when you have an animal that's low on the crocodile branch. And some people have argued that all archosaurs would have started off you know, that a high metabolic rate is ancestral for archosauria and that modern day crocodilians have lost that. And there are very good reasons for that argument. I'm, I'm relatively partial to that argument. On the other hand, there's very little about aetosaurs that looks like they're high meta metabolic great animals. So he, we are in the process of doing a variety of things, trying to look at this, and he's got a, a very complex data set. But fundamentally, trying to look at extant animals and model what Aetosaurs might have done. Of course, the actual mass of the animal is the most important variable as far as how much it, it burns. But then other things, you know, comparing it to um, other largely endothermic animals to try and see where they might fly, fall out, how crocodilian or turtle-like might they be. Uh, and finally, on kind of a lighter note, this was my, uh, my you know, this is a part, of, this is the, one of the cover photos I provided for this. Um, you know, they're not dinosaurs, Aetosaurs don't show up in artwork. There is no town which has Aetosaur fossil or Aetosaur reconstructions distributed about the town. Um, so, uh, right, but, um, this is a very interesting mount of paratypothorax in Stuttgart, and the preparator who did this, also all those welds are individual welds. He spent quite a bit of time tacking this thing together. Um, and I, I rather like it. I kind of like this helmeted knight look of uh, the thing. And so one of my colleagues at Appalachian, Lauren Waterworth, she dreamed up, she's like, well, yeah, we don't have an exhibits department because we're a university not, and we have a very tiny little museum. But we do have an art department, and so she worked with this artist in the um, art department, Travis Donovan, and they came up and they sculpted, his class sculpted a life-size model of our friend Gorgetta Soukas, taking it from um, Matt Selesky's artwork, turning it into a three-dimensional thing. There's a variety of fascinating tools involved with this, and then putting plasticine, or uh, making plasticine and putting it on over it. And developing an animal that they now call Archie because I kept hearing about Archosaurs. So that is a life-size model that we are um, hoping very much to get installed as a bronze on campus here in the relatively um, near future. So uh, in conclusion, you know, if you know about Aetosaurs, they're actually you know, relatively well known. We've known Aetosaur fossils since 1830. We've known that they were crocodilian relatives since 1859. Yet their, their record is not great. We don't fully understand what they are, were doing biologically. We don't fully understand even how exactly they're related to each other, what their metabolic rates were, et cetera. 
Um, and so there's a lot of things I think that we can still do with these animals. We're really just beginning to get a grasp of their diversity. And so their extended paleobiology is something that we still have an opportunity to do a lot of things with going forward. So with that, uh, thank you very much for your attention and I'll be happy to answer questions.